Hey everyone, this is Lynn Richards and welcome to the next edition of On the Park Bench, a public square conversation brought to you by the Congress for the New Urbanism. The purpose of these webinars is to provide a platform for CNU members to engage and to share information as we navigate this uh, public health crisis and corresponding um, economic issues. I want to remind everyone that we are taking CNU 28 online um, for our first ever virtual gathering. We're as, as disappointed as we are with this decision, we're still looking forward to engaging members from all over the country as well as international. So we're hoping that the Congress this year will have a, have a, a broad, a very broad response um, from across the world. But today we want to hear directly from um, our local government members. Um, as many of you are aware, our state and local governments have been absolutely hammered um, uh, from responding to the pandemic, caring for our most vulnerable populations, as well as trying to maintain the momentum of just getting the basic work of the, of the local government down. So today we're going to hear from longtime member Carrie Hayes, who's currently Chief of Staff in Chattanooga, Tennessee. Kerry provides ongoing political and policy guidance to further the mayor's agenda. Kerry has been um, just an incredible partner to us. Jacob Lindsay is the Director of Planning and Preservation and Sustainability for the City of Charleston, South Carolina. He just to told me that his very first Congress was in 2000 or was in 1998. So he's been with CNU for a long time. Julie Mayfield uh, is an amazing star from Asheville, North Carolina. Um, she has been on the city council there and works on transportation, the environment and clean energy. I think uh, I think Julie is our only elected uh, official on us today. I have heard from my friends in, in North Carolina that we should watch out that she will be um, governor someday of North Carolina. She's just that awesome. Dan uh, Baisden attended his first CNU, CNU 24 in Detroit. Um, and has been a convert ever since. He's currently the neighborhood planner and public arts manager at the city of Fort Wayne, Indiana, and serves as the vice chair for the CNU Midwest. Um, many of you have met and have corresponded with Dan. He's just a bundle of energy. Um, to me, Dan represents the future of, of the movement. Um, he's just really amazing. And then Monica Holmes is the manager of Urban Design Center in the city of Charlotte. Um, again, uh, this is the, the future of the movement. She has extens extensive charrette design experience working with stakeholders to reach sustainable and implementable, implementable solutions. Um, I just have recently met Monica and have become a huge fan, but this isn't about uh, seeing you or um, or all of these folks. So I want to turn this over right now to Carrie. Carrie, take it away. All right. Thank you, Lynn, so much uh, for the opportunity. And thanks to everybody who's making some time uh, to, to, to listen in. Uh, I'm guessing that this may be an audience of a lot of folks who work for local government or, or quasi governmental agencies. So I, I sympathize with how, how busy everyone is, and I really do appreciate the time uh, to share some of what we've been thinking about and to, to hear from my fellow panelists about what their approach has been over the last few weeks. Um, I guess I, I would characterize our, uh, the city of Chattanooga's official response to the coronavirus began uh, the week of the 9th of March, um, which I think is more or less when uh, it became clear to cities of our size. We're a city of about 180,000 people in the southeast corner of Tennessee. Uh, that we really were about to confront something pretty, pretty unprecedented and pretty shocking in terms of what what uh, may start to occur. Uh, the very first step that we took, which I'm, I'm guessing maybe similar to a lot of you, was to close a senior center, which uh, at the time that we were making that decision felt like a uh, a radical move of uh, of government uh, intervention in a public health crisis, which was to close one one public facility that was frequented by by folks over the age of 65. Uh, the speed with which we then tried to sort of uh, uh, continue to, to intervene through executive orders by the mayor uh, is, is in, in my recollection, uh, almost comical because I, I would sort of say, and I still say, you know, it feels like every day I'm having a conversation about something that felt absolutely 
uh, dystopian, uh, science fiction level dystopian, maybe two days before. That, that began then with closing some community centers and some other public buildings. And of course, it was City Hall, then it was dining rooms, and it was other types of businesses. And so um, we were both um, uh, trying to move with a lot of speed and also with a lot of legal precision and to make sure that we had the proper legal footing underneath us uh, with which to do this. That's um, uh, another conversation for a different panel, but um, I'm sure in every state that, that may be represented in this audience, that looks a little bit different in every county, it may look a little bit different, uh, but certainly making sure that we were doing things uh, the right way for the right reason, reason was always our concern. Um, and, and CNU was on my mind a lot during this period, uh, uh, mostly because I ended up having to cancel. I'm very sorry, Lynn, Lynn was kind enough to invite me and a couple of other people to, to start brainstorming a little bit more specifically about uh, how to serve uh, some of the charter's content in a little bit more of an actionable way to local elected officials, which is, which is something I'm still very interested in. And the fact that that coincided so closely with our having to, to take some steps in response to the crisis was, was sadly kind of ironic. But I say that to say that, um, as we got deeper into this, I found myself having conversations with people uh, that, that just felt so, um, so much like I was trying to, to ride a bicycle backwards or right with my left hand or something, because I was sort of judging our success in responding to the crisis by a set of metrics that felt so counterintuitive to my uh, personal beliefs and what some of the things that we try to accomplish as a city. So I would say things like, hey, if a park is empty, that's great. Or if this trail doesn't have any people on it, nothing makes me happier. Or if I can remove every customer and every employee from a local business, that's my that's the only thing I want to accomplish today. And that sounds... Uh, ghoulish uh, when I say it that way, but but to the degree that so much of what we care about and what we try to do, uh, both as a Congress and certainly as a city, uh, is try to engineer, um, you know, a community. We're, we're, we're social creatures and that's that's so much of what we're about and so much of what, what has always drawn me to, 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 to CNU's uh, kind of political philosophy, if I can say that it has one, which is this idea that you need to prioritize uh, the places in your city and all and all of the infrastructure that it has uh, for humans to be in community with one another. And we know that over the past six weeks or so, that has been uh, the most unbelievably dangerous thing we could possibly do. So trying to make sure that we can still facilitate that uh, through, through all the same sort of online environments that we're in right now, um, and also trying to make sure that we are uh, proceeding in such a way as a mayor's office that we're maintaining the political credibility and the sort of, you know, what the mayor would call the moral authority to keep making uh, tougher and tougher decisions uh, has been has been a great challenge. Sometimes we, I think we've done it okay. Sometimes I know we've, we've, we've mishandled it. Uh, we're now uh, in the position that I think some, some markets are, are getting to where we're trying to sort of pivot to, to what a reopening scenario might look like and trying to be very thoughtful about uh, the, the, what the data tells us uh, about what that could look like. Um, I hope uh, and I believe, and I'm trying very hard myself to make sure that I'm learning as much as I can about uh, the delivery systems in our city uh, from a healthcare standpoint um, and how, how dangerous uh, they are and how much they continue to put very vulnerable people at a disadvantage, uh, particularly people that are transit insecure. Um, uh, hourly wage workers, uh, people experiencing homelessness, th those are the people that, um, while our county health department has done a great job uh, expanding testing as rapidly as they can, are still really uh, not able to access uh, a lot of the resources that they need because while I think Chattanooga has a great planning culture in a lot of terrific places, it's, it's like a lot of, a lot of some belt cities in the sense that it's just completely built around a, an auto first uh, mindset and has been for many decades. And we, we see, uh, how, how really literally dangerous that is in moments like this, uh, where people are forcibly isolated, separated from one another, and able to access uh, even prescriptions and things uh, only only from a car um, that, that he or she may not have. So uh, all that to say, we're, we're trying to make sure we end up in a best case scenario, which would be um, uh, reprioritizing some of the way that we're making land use decisions and transportation decisions, uh, trying to reprioritize some of the ways that we might use federal funds when they start to appear. Uh, in cities like ours and to try to make sure that we're continuing to kind of reach for for people on the margins of our society uh, to make sure that they're prioritized and, and, and supported uh, through this for however much longer it, it lasts. So with that, uh, I'll stop rambling and hand it to hand it to Jacob. Okay, Kerry, thank you so much. And, and thank you to Lynn and the Congress. It's really an honor to be here and, and be here with this great group of panelists. So uh, greetings from beautiful downtown Charleston. 
it's um, it's good for now or the weather holds out and it's not summer yet. So uh, it's, it's great to talk to all of you from outdoors. Um, as a little bit of context, we uh, are a city of about 150,000 people in a metro of around 800,000. And we received in last year um, about 8 million visitors. We are a tourist uh, driven city, but we also have a super diverse economy built on technology, shipping, medical services, um, and many other industries that come together that make this a really thriving and rapidly growing uh, Sunbelt city. That's the context in which we work. And in response to the coronavirus, we have a whole team of people who are doing a phenomenal job. It's Charleston is a city that is accustomed to crises. We have had earthquakes, fires, wars, and hurricanes nearly every year. Um, uh, for the past four years, we've had these major climate events. So we're ready for, for emergencies. This is a little different, of course, and it has caused us, like everyone else, to have to adapt. Luckily, my department are not the ones that are dealing with those emergency responses. We have great folks that do that, and it's allowed us to focus on planning and to understand how we adapt our processes during this really challenging time. And what I'd like to talk about are, first of all, our comprehensive planning process. I know a lot of cities are in comp plan years. And then second, how we are running our public boards and commissions, or in our case, not running them yet. And, uh, and hopefully that will be relevant to some of the folks who are on, on this call. So we, first of all, talk about our comprehensive plan. The city of Charleston is one of the, the cities that is being reshaped by sea level rise and climate change. We are facing a radically different uh, present than we had 20 years ago, and our future we know will be even more um, challenged than it is today. And we are an historic and, and very um, significant historic downtown for the, the country, a place with a long-standing relationship with the CNU, famous for the walkable urban environment, the, the quality and the type of architecture, and even our, um, our first and second ring suburban areas are still really excellent uh, places. And as a part of this comprehensive plan, we have the challenge of protecting them as we face sea level rise, climate change, and of course the, the shared crisis of housing affordability that successful cities face. So the comprehensive plan is kind of an important thing for us this year. In fact, it's the biggest thing that we're going to be doing this year and we find ourselves, like many cities, more or less hamstrung because we had anticipated 20 different public meetings that would be attended by thousands of people in person that was baked into the cake of our strategy. We're not updating our former plan. We're starting over completely with a whole new base uh, uh, zoning, more or less the base system um, at, at, that's totally informed by sea level rise and climate change. And we can't conduct that work totally in a black box. So what we are doing in response is shifting to an online engagement platform that will run for the entirety of the comprehensive plan. But we know that we can't conduct this without in-person meetings. So we've taken our very robust in-person engagement and in discussions with all of the people who have advised us the best, we have moved it for now to the height of the summer. It appears that we may have the most opportunity at that time to potentially hold in-person meetings and we are hoping to do them in a socially distanced fashion. We're planning for larger spaces. We've even talked about outdoor spaces to be able to have in-person engagement socially distanced. And hopefully by that point, we'll be internally working on data, working with our consultants to understand how sea level rise and climate change affect us, really doing the work that we can do internally, engaging online, and then shifting uh, to in-person engagement later in the summer. However, we are acknowledging the fact that there's a possibility that social distancing in large meetings may not be possible. And as we adjust and go into the summer, if it looks like we can't deliver, we may in fact end up seeking uh, a request in front of the governor to allow us to push back our deadline. We think that it's a possibility that we may not be able to have the large meetings that we feel are integral to the public engagement that our comprehensive plan demands. And if that's the case, we're not going to move the plan forward. We're going to actually uh, push our deadline back. And hopefully by that point, if we do that, we'll have phenomenal public engagement in addition to having an extra six or so months to crunch data and have a really robust uh, data set underneath the plan itself. So we're moving forward, but playing it by ear. The second thing that I'd like to talk about is our, our boards and commissions. Our department runs seven different boards and commissions. Um, our Board of Architectural Review, which was the first in the nation, 
and which DPC actually helped us rework a few years ago and, and also created a whole new um, height and story system for our downtown core. Um, we also have our design review board, which oversees design in our suburban areas, our boards of zoning appeal, and of course our planning commission, all of, all of those we administer. And presently, none of them are operating. We are still receiving applications. Our, our city has not passed a moratorium, which is necessary in our city to stop the, the receipt of applications. So we have projects in the queue that are seeking entitlements that are stacking up uh, as the weeks go by. Things that can be done at staff level, we are still processing. My staff are mostly working from home, some in the office, socially distanced, and we can do all of our staff level work. But things that require public hearings are all docked right now because in, the, in our state, we have a very stringent set of requirements related to public input for these boards. The board members need to be able to interact with the public as they speak per state statute, preferably in a visible fashion. And we're working through Zoom as our platform, which we use here. However, the challenge that we're seeking, and I bet many of these other cities are as well, is that should an entitlement be granted by virtual meeting, it could potentially be challenged by opponents down the road who could say that, the, that portions of the meeting were not conducted in, in uh, accordance with state law. So it's a real challenge. And just today, um, through the mayor, we have pulled together a new broader interdisciplinary team with our legal staff, with our IT staff, city hall staff, as well as our clerk of council to begin to look at this from all angles to make sure that we can bring forward a process that is robust and that stands the test of any potential legal challenge. So our goal in regards to the, what the boards and commissions and the comprehensive plan is that at the end of the day, we do shift to virtual processes. We continue to think about how we meet socially distanced and that when this is all over, hopefully we will have in-person meetings just like we used to with the new online engagement that gives us a much more robust process than we've ever had before. Hopefully our public engagement will be bigger and better coming out of this. The last thing that I'll say, and I'll try to end on a positive note, this is such a challenge and there are so many people who are in crisis and who are burdened by this. And we are working on all fronts to help meet those challenges. There are some bright spots and in our beautiful city, just like everywhere else, our parks are closed. Um, our, our shops and restaurants are, are mostly closed. Um, some are still operating, but our streets are open. There's less traffic than there has ever been. And what we have seen is that people are able to be out safely on their bikes. There are people riding bikes on streets that were never safe to ride on. There are people out running in the streets with strollers. And we've seen a vision of what a city can be like if we make a shift to different modes. And there's a little bit of optimism in this that in fact, maybe in the future, our streets can be more multimodal than they are today. And there is a little bit of a bright spot in the vision of the future. So with that said, I'm gonna hand it over to someone that I had the pleasure to meet uh, last year at the Congress for the New Urbanism, um, the powerhouse, Julie Mayfield. Um, I will turn <laughs> it over to you. Thanks, Jacob. Um, uh, and thanks to CNU for hosting this. I'm happy to be here. I love talking about our, um, the great city of Asheville. And uh, let me give you a little bit of context for Asheville for folks who don't know it. Um, we are uh, about 93,000 people we swell by a, an additional 50%, so about another 50,000 people every day due to commuters. And then like Charleston, we are an enormous tourist town. <clears throat> we welcome over 11 million visitors a year with about 4 million of those being overnight guests, people you would consider sort of traditional tourists. Um, tourism in Asheville employs about 26,000 people uh, and most of the businesses that those people are employed in are closed, not surprisingly. Um, some of our city's largest employers are in the tourism industry, the Biltmore Estate, the Grove Park Inn, and um, just for an example, those two institutions, businesses have um, each furloughed uh, over 2,000 people. Um, so, you know, Asheville is also known for our um, small locally owned businesses, uh, retail restaurants, breweries, distilleries, galleries, and, uh, you know, there's a lot of concern those will survive um, this um, the, 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 the pandemic. We're, we're very worried about that. Um, and of course, uh, you know, we're also taking our budget situation as a city um, very seriously. Um, that, that situation is completely shifted. The, the, the ironic thing here is um, on March 13th, we had a full day council retreat where we started talking about uh, we spent all day talking about how to spend the you know estimated sort of seven million dollars in um, new revenue that we were going to have uh, for next year 
within just a few days, of course, that whole um, that whole framework shifted, and uh, we're now trying to hang on to everything that we offer um, right now, and are not talking about adding new things like renewables and expanding transit and, uh, and things like that. So it's um, it's it's a little bit sad, but it it uh, if everybody else is feeling whiplash in this, um, it certainly we are as well. So I want to talk about a couple things. Um, number one, sort of. just a little bit. Um, can everybody still hear me? Something just weird happened. Okay. Um, all right. So the, the one of the first things that happened, uh, like Charleston, and I'm sure everybody else, all of our boards and commissions stopped meeting. Um, and that's not just the quasi judicial ones, but but everything just stopped meeting all of a sudden. And, you know, as in many governments, those many things start at those boards and commissions and work their way up. Um, so we're we're just in a situation where nothing is happening, and um, frankly, as an elected official, I'm, I, many days I just feel completely useless because uh, I'm not doing the normal things that I'm doing, and that's very frustrating. Um, our planning staff, our entire city staff, of course, most of the city staff, of course, started working remotely. Um, our our planning staff, and I, I'm sure this has happened in other cities as well. Um, we started redeploying, our city manager started redeploying city staff to places that, um, that, that we needed help in terms of the immediate response to the virus, um, whether people had any expertise in that or not. So um, some of our planning staff started staffing the 211 um, uh, hotline where people were seeking information on basic uh, needs and resources. Um, one of the things that we've done to serve the homeless in Asheville is we have opened up our civic center to house 50 um, homeless uh, people who were sort of in high risk, as if being homeless isn't enough for being high risk for the virus. These are particularly high risk people um, uh, to shelter them, and some of our planning staff are, are staffing that, uh, staffing that location. Our our um, planning staff started doing policy research on uh, issues that kept coming or that were coming out of the emergency um, operations center you know, best practices on staying home, staying safe, um, you know, and, and then how can, we, how can we relax zoning restrictions and enforcement on everything from parking to short-term rentals to, um, you know, fines and all sorts of things. And, and we, have, um, we have stopped enforcing any parking regulations, the meter's free, the decks are free, um, short-term rentals, of course, all of our lodging is closed, um, but, uh, Short-term rentals can now rent long-term if they want, or their permit doesn't normally allow them to do that. So a lot of just sort of, you know, taking business as usual and figuring out how to adapt it for where we are right now. And then now that, you know, we're sort of getting to a little bit of a place of stasis, um, and I should say that Buncombe County, um, at this point anyway, seems to have missed the surge, the surge that we were expecting uh, in the virus has not happened. We've been very lucky. I think we, we jumped on this really early. Um, and so now our um, uh, staff is starting to work on, you know, how do we how do we reopen? What what can we what can we do to start to start reopening the city? Um, our planning staff had been working on an amazing uh, range and set of of um, ordinances and policies that we, we have really been anticipating for a couple of years. Um, we adopted our new comprehensive plan, I think, in twenty. 17 maybe early 2018 and our planning staff has been working on um, a new tree ordinance open space standards an urban new urban center um, zoning category uh, we have been working on a long-standing piece of controversial property downtown about what to do with it we actually have a hotel moratorium in place right now and the staff is supposed to be coming up with regulations to for to put in place when we emerge out of that later this year um, the noise ordinance, I mean, the, 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 the intensity and the importance of the things that the staff has been working on, all of which were supposed to come to us this spring for, uh, for a vote, all of that has just now sort of come to a screeching halt. Most of those things had already had some pretty robust public engagement, but the, you know, what we don't want to do is bring these things to council um, when nobody can come to council and nobody can come talk to us uh, directly and in person um, you know, these are all big, important things that people will have a lot to say about. And uh, so we're just 
we're just putting them on hold for right now. But that's very, um, that's very frustrating for those of us who like to see policy moving forward. And the big question, um, Jacob talked about this, is how do we craft meaningful public engagement uh, around these issues? Um, you know, we can't, we're not, you know, nobody can come to our city council meetings. They're soon all gonna be remote. That's not an effective way to do it. Um, and we're, we have not figured that out. Um, although Jacob, I'm gonna have my planning director call you about um, what, what you have mentioned. And then, so the staff started thinking about, you know, how do we, what are some more longer term things that we can start looking at um, since we can't sort of move forward on these short term things that we've gotten teed up, but we run into the same problem, which is how, how can we craft meaningful public engagement on the front end of big issues? Um, and how do we deal with people who, you know, aren't tech savvy and don't have this kind of, uh, this kind of technology to really participate. So we're, we're really struggling with that. Um, and then let me just say a, a word about transit as well. I'm sure like many other cities, um, we have really cut back on our transit system in a number of ways. Um, we, the first thing is, you know, when, when the city sort of shut down in March and all the buildings and, rest and uh, businesses started closing, um, everybody, uh, a, a lot of people started riding the bus because there was nowhere else to go. So uh, what that meant was that there were too many people on the bus, they were too close to each other, there were too many people at the station, they were falling asleep. Um, and of course, nobody at that point had masks or gowns or gloves or, you know, we didn't have any of that. So um, we closed the, the inside of our transit station, we added porta johns and hand washing stations outside. We pretty quickly went to fare free. Um, we asked people to enter the bus through the rear of the bus. Um, we increased a police presence at the station uh, to try to you know, enforce some social distancing. And then this was the real um, heartbreaker, but we had to do it. We reduced ridership on the bus to no more than 10 people, and that includes the drivers. So we have buses that can normally care, carry you know, 40, 50 people who are now carrying nine passengers. And that is just painful because people are getting left at the bus stops. And um, as a longtime transit advocate, that really just breaks my heart. Um, we also cut two routes so that um, we could increase the frequency of buses on some of the higher, um, uh, higher traffic routes. And, um, but now, of course, we, again, we have to figure out how to deal with the people who are on those routes who don't have service anymore and the people who are getting left behind at the bus bus stations of the bus stops. So one of the things that we're doing uh, very actively is trying to figure out how to spend the CARES Act money that is coming to us. Asheville is slated to get about $3.6 million in transit related CARES Act funding. And um, you know, how are we going to do that? Can we obviously we'll make up budget shortfalls due to COVID, um, but can we figure out a way to to better service those people who are who are stranded right now? Um, and then also, I'm, I'm going to be advocating for using some of that money to expand our service uh, and continue implementing our transit master plan that we're, um, that we're just in year, uh, well, we're supposed to be in year two. So, so I'll stop there uh, and I will turn it over to Dan. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm going to share my screen and see if this works. So um, let's see you. Screen mode. Okay. Well, thank you so much for uh, allowing me to be part of this today. And uh, just a little bit of context about Fort Wayne. We're a city of about 267,000 people. Um, we're the second largest city in the state of Indiana, and we're a border city with Ohio and only about 40 minutes from Michigan. So not only are we affected by what's going on in Indiana, uh, we have a lot of uh, transit uh, population for work and um, travel to and from two other states that are uh, equally affected. And as you know, Michigan has had a lot of um, uh, major concerns lately with their city of Detroit. Um, so we followed a lot of Governor Holcomb's orders and uh, as you may have seen, Indiana has joined a group of states, uh, primarily in the Midwest, on how to do a safe uh, reopening as well. Um, a little bit about me, let's see, okay, that works. I'm a new convert to new urbanism is what I like to call myself. Uh, I grew up in eastern Ohio in the shadow of steel mills and industry. I was a kid of an entrepreneur's uh, in a small town, and I was always fascinated with the idea of community and how it could work to thrive um, with limited resources, especially in a community that was undergoing a huge economic transformation. Um, my freshman year of high school, my librarian uh, introduced me to Jane Jacobs in the book Death and Life, um, which I'll tell you as a high school freshman is not an easy read, let alone being a college freshman or anybody today. 
it's still a pretty um, uh, critical book for all of us to read though. Um, our community did not have a plan of any kind until the late 90s and, um, and that was a big deal because we had a huge industry in our community that shut down and um, you know, majority of the, the people that lived in the town ended up losing their jobs. So um, I, I say this is a unique situation for me because I grew up in an area that knew how to deal with mass closure um, for a sustained period of time. And so we know as this uh, unfolds what, what this could look like as we could see some major closures, how's that going to affect each of our communities? Um, our, our town ended up creating an asset plan, one that was built off the existing strengths of communities, and that's something I've always found interesting and has piqued my interest over time. So prior to working in neighborhood planning, I spent about a dozen years as an operations director, uh, program director, and on-air host for uh, radio stations across the country. I lived in Arizona, Utah, uh, Indiana, and uh, Ohio, uh, Kentucky as well. Radio really gave me a great opportunity to experience different communities not from a planner perspective, but from a resident perspective. And then finally in uh, 2015, I ended up um, finding out about the Congress for the Urbanism and uh, came to my first one in Detroit is where I met Lynn. So um, I, I wanted to look at this instead of necessarily from a planning perspective, but you know what it looks like from a community perspective. So I asked the question, how will COVID-19 impact your neighborhood planning efforts? And um, uh, your community moving forward. So I asked a group of planners and this was their responses um, and, and all great responses, widen sidewalks, create temporary bike lanes, close streets for pedestrian traffic only, and uh, the idea of uh, continued planning, which is great. Um, but then when you ask the people that live in the neighborhoods, the neighborhood leaders that um, really are on the front line response with their residents right there, uh, right down the street, um, they're saying, you know, repair the existing sidewalks. What about Wi-Fi for our neighborhood kids that, um, you know, have to do e-learning at home? Um, uh, they want to see us continue planning and, and doing a different kind of planning, response planning on, on, on how to uh, deal with the stuff moving forward. Um, spend time with us. That was one of the things that really stood out to me. They want us to have just a regular chats one-on-one -on -one with them during this time and um, just being able to listen and calm their fears. Uh, install art, uh, public art, more outdoor dining, increase food access, and find ways to build uh, neighborhood relationships along with find ways uh, to support our most vulnerable residents. Um, and so what I found out was that the planners that responded were focused mostly on the physical aspects where the neighborhood presidents and empowered leaders in the neighborhoods were more focused on the social aspects of how to um, handle this. Uh, we know that long range planning and community development works best when we build on the key relationships. Uh, this time, this is really truly the time where cities need practitioners the most in this field. Um, pandemics and rece uh, recessions bring out good and bad. Um, the bad is more pronounced as we're expected to see growing inequality um, after this is over and through this. Um, community development really allows everybody to have a seat at the table. And we know that uh, community development practitioners are vital in assisting communities to understand how to close the gap between neighborhoods and the residents. So uh, our, our, our division has done a couple different things. Um, I, I'm also the public art manager. So we've moved our meetings on online to Zoom, which has been really an interesting uh, way to handle some of those meetings. Our staff meetings have been moved on to GoToMeeting. Uh, and so trying to connect on a regular basis with uh, coworkers has been fun. Um, and uh, our department's been working with the health department on a community needs survey. Our city also recently launched a COVID-19 resource page, which lists websites for local organizations and business associations. Um, we're also pushing out all this information on social media. Um, we launched a project um, right, at, I think it was the first week when this uh, lockdown, or I shouldn't say lockdown, but um, you know, a stay in place happened. Uh, and that was called Wave Fort Wayne. And so our idea was to get people to go out at seven o'clock at night and wave to their neighbor. It was something really simple, really easy to do. It just required a couple of graphics and a good press release. And CNN and People Magazine actually ended up picking this story up and talked about how a city in the Midwest is telling their neighbors to go outside nightly and check on their uh, neighborhood residents. Um, a couple of these pictures here is some of the neighborhoods I work with Fairfield. They're taking roadside litter and they're turning it into hearts that people can stick in their yards as just a way of positive reinforcement that we're going to get through this. So FW means Fort Wayne, obviously Fort Wayne's strong. Our downtown clean and green team, uh, they, um, how many times has your city went out and um, cleaned bike racks? 
Uh, it's not something that we often think of, you know, the bike rack sitting there, um, but they're going out and they're disinfecting the bike racks on a regular basis. They're uh, disinfecting parking meters and uh, benches and uh, things like that. So people can still go out and use the street furniture all throughout downtown. I think they're even washing some of the windows and doing the doors too. Uh, Johnny May Farm is a great organization based in one of our southeast neighborhoods. Um, and uh, it's an old converted fire station that turned into a public um, farm and kitchen. And so they've taught online Zoom courses on how to garden in your own backyard. So they're trying to take this instead of everybody having to come to Johnny May over this time. They're saying, you know, you can do this from home. Um, West Central Neighborhood has done Zumba classes out in the street where they have um, provided people the opportunity to go out and learn how to, um, you know, try a new activity. Uh, and then our Packard neighborhoods, um, uh, this was a lot of fun. A couple of weeks ago, we got the uh, neighborhood presidents from all of our Packard neighborhoods to get together on a Zoom call and we did Zoom happy hour. And so instead of focusing on all the, all the problems facing our neighborhoods, we really just had a good time uh, getting to know each other a little bit more and, and talking about different things. Um, the other thing our department's working on, we are writing a neighborhood plan, uh, a couple neighborhood plans and a comprehensive plan too. So we're, we're still staying busy, which is great. Uh, there truly is no better time right now than, uh, than right now for cities to invest in human and social capital. Uh, we also know that innovation occurs when people are truly invested in, and that's what community development does. It invests in people and neighborhoods. Our nation will need innovation to fuel the economy and our communities moving forward. Uh, we definitely should spend time studying our assets and how they can be maximized for our residents. Um, we also need to change a question instead of looking back to figure out how to move forward. We need to look forward and knowing that things are going to change. You know, growing up in Eastern Ohio in the Rust Belt is what they call. Um, we know that jobs are changing. We know that how we dine out will change. Um, how we shop, work, play, all this is going to change. We are social creatures and we expect that we're going to, um, maybe spread out a little bit more, but at the same time, we truly do love to spend time with each other. We're gonna hear from Monica next, but I wanna leave you with this. Community development practitioners, visionaries, and researchers only when we listen to the people we are working for. Cities that engage and empower uh, people and build resilient social networks will come out the strongest, and that's the way our cities are going to move forward. Great. That's, it's really interesting to hear the things that you guys are doing, Dan. So my name's uh, Monica Holmes and I uh, manage the Urban Design Center. I'm an urban designer. I manage the Urban Design Center for the city of Charlotte, which uh, hearing all of you all is, uh, I guess, the largest city um, kind of represented out of this group. And we're a city of about uh, 850,000 people in uh, the Charlotte region, obviously the core of that region of over 2 million people. Um, and our Urban Design Center sits within a planning department that represents both the permitting side, the planning side, and the kind of entitlement side, and obviously design and preservation. So we're a department of about 115 people, um, and I work within the design and preservation division. Uh, so we have been challenged really broadly as a city and as a department. Um, everything, like some of you all have mentioned, how to issue building permits, how to have rezoning uh, hearing meetings. So we actually had our first rezoning meeting virtually uh, last Monday. So that's recorded. If anybody would like to go and see how that played out, uh, you can go on the charlottenc.gov website and see how uh, logistically that worked. And I'd be happy to connect others to uh, the manager for that. Um, we also last night had our public forum virtually where people called in uh, to our city council meeting. Um, so we have really been trying to tackle, and I, I honestly um, commend those in our city government who have been doing um, a lot of the heavy lifting on getting all of those things up and running online. Um, so that's kind of the macro scale. I'll start kind of at the large level and get more detailed in my thoughts and comments. Um, as, as a lot of other people have probably also experienced, um, the, the good is we're operating and running. The bad is that, uh, you know, we are kind of experiencing, which I'm sure both private, public, nonprofit, everybody's experiencing. Um, we're under a hiring freeze where we can't hire new people currently. Uh, we're really looking at what is the long-term impact of this on our budget, you know, as 
Julie mentioned all the all the lofty dreams uh, that we were all talking about uh, and how to spend all of our money has kind of come screeching to a halt as we take a more conservative look and approach at what the next couple of years actually look like. Um, our transit system, as everyone else's, has been greatly impacted. Uh, the city of Charlotte we have in our county um, a little over 1,500 uh, COVID cases and um, over 40, uh, I think it's 43 deaths. So we are really feeling the impacts on um, all levels of how does that impact transit. We've had a couple of transit workers um, get sick. How does it impact other emergency services? Uh, so, so Obviously, we're kind of feeling those impacts across the board. We're doing the same things with free transit in or from the back. Um, we, our trains are still running, our buses are still running. But again, it's looking at how does that, uh, how do we last over a longer period of time, kind of keeping that level of operation. Um, we also are in the middle of very large planning efforts. So the city of Charlotte is doing our first comprehensive plan that we've done in over 40 years. And we are in a spot with that where um, it's heavy in engagement. Um, like you were mentioning, Jacob, we're, we're struggling with what does the engagement look like. Um, we have a group of over 200 strategic advisors who are on our comprehensive plan kind of coordinating committee. And they met virtually for the first time last week. Uh, but again, it, it gets to a question of equity and how are you making sure everybody has a seat at the table when uh, your life is on Zoom, right? Everybody doesn't have the luxury of spending two hours on Zoom, um, especially with what might be going on um, in their life. So we are kind of working through that. Our team has taken a creative approach to that and really used this pause to focus on education. So they put a lot of resources into doing um, education and really using, so we're very lucky in the fact that our planning director, who is also our assistant city manager, has a pretty good uh, social media following. <laughs> so we've been posting and pushing uh, kind of general concepts in our comprehensive plan uh, through social media by using that kind of reach and just getting general feedback, kind of like how you were showing Dan, throwing questions out there and then seeing what the response is are to them and how we can um, you know, use that information to then craft the engagement that we have going forward. So what do people think about this framework policy? Um, we're also rewriting our unified development ordinance and incorporating a lot of form-based code components. Um, that has, again, been a challenge in this environment, but it's forced our team to really dive into the details and work in small groups. So they've been doing using this time and this kind of pause to really focus on um, the actual drafting and going through drafting um, and that level of focused attention. And then uh, we've had our first kind of ordinance advisory committee meeting, which is a group of about 40 people uh, that happened last week on Zoom for that. Uh, my team specifically, we focus on uh, three major things in the Urban Design Center, which is our placemaking and public space program. In the city of Charlotte, uh, we do not have parks. Uh, the county handles all of our parks, uh, which has created an interesting kind of gap in service. Um, so our team tends to fill that gap. So uh, Charlotte Mecklenburg is really great at very large parks, but not really great at small parks because we're a very uh, recreation focused parks department. Because of that, we rank 96th in our park score with the Trust for Public Land. So out of 100 top 100 cities, the city of Charlotte is 96. Uh, only 30, about 35% of our population has access uh, within a 10 minute walk to a public park. So as you can imagine, as all of our parks are, um, the, our parks are still currently open, but the active, the playgrounds, the basketball courts are closed and all the parking lots are closed. Uh, when, but when people can't walk there, that makes it very difficult. So um, our team has been very focused on partnering with CDOT in this time, our transportation department to, uh, we are actually, um, it's a little still under the radar, but we're actually working on a shared streets program that will launch that will give access to more population um, public space. So how can you 
use the street as public space. Uh, our, our program is also interested in um, working on our corridors program. So what do our corridor revitalization program look like coming out of this? Um, and then the third focus, which Dan really ties into your work, is public art and how we're incorporating public art into our uh, placemaking and what does that look like? So uh, as part of our uh, shared streets program soon to launch, we are going to be uh, also launching an artist program. So we are kind of fast action. Our city manager is, is very uh, creative and likes to push the envelope. So he actually called us on Friday and challenged us to spend money on some public art and get it done uh, in the next couple of weeks. So we are uh, soon to launch by the end of the week a public artist program that will uh, include um, street murals uh, throughout our city and we'll kind of get some immediate work into our arts community. Uh, so we're very excited about that. Um, that's a little sampling of some of the things that we are working on that kind of have immediate, hopefully positive impact. Uh, we are obviously working on addressing immediate needs in other parts of the city. So whether that be food, education, access to employment, uh, other departments in our city are heavily focused on supporting those. But I'll kind of wrap up my uh, comments with that. And it looks like there's a couple of people in the Q&A that have some thoughts. Thanks, Monica. And thanks, um, everyone else, um, for that kind of good overview. Um, there are some questions in the queue. But I want to I wanna touch on something that Monica and several of you have said. So to meet the public engagement requirements for your city, many of you are moving to an online platform such as Zoom. Um, for those in the listening audience that want to hear more about that, we had an on the park bench on how to do a virtual charrette um, a couple of weeks ago and it's on our website. So as we move online, and then Monica, you even said, well, how do we address equity issues there? Because not everybody can engage equally. So I know that all five of your cities are very much com committed to increasing the um, inclusion and increasing opportunity for your residents. So how are you um, reconciling this issue between moving online through Zoom and addressing these equity issues. And that's for anyone. I will say just one thing that we've learned is that it's really important that you use platforms that have call-in options um, because more people have access to a telephone than to kind of the online video chat. So just like when you're measuring what you use, I will say that, I mean, it's not perfect, but the ability to have a dial-in phone is very important. And when you're putting together materials, thinking about how someone can understand the materials without um, a screen or a PowerPoint. So that's, that's just one tip that I have. I would love to hear what other people are thinking with that. Well, I'll just jump in briefly. We have not solved this problem. Um, we're figuring it out on the fly. And I totally agree with what Monica said, that it is true that uh, you want to call an option. And what we've seen so far in our city council, which is meeting via Zoom, that we have far more um, participants than we would have in, in an in-person meeting. So I think that more people are able to dial in. They can be at home making dinner with their kids, but they can dial in, put themselves on mute, and they are listening in to and, and, and participating in the meeting. So we actually have had broader participation so far. However, giving input is a different matter entirely. That's why I think that ultimately when we do hopefully solve this in a couple of weeks, we will probably have a hybrid where we may have a terminal set up at our uh, main municipal building where people can go if they don't have access to a computer at home and they can stand in front of a computer, socially distance, of course, from other participants, in addition to all of those who would be participating at home. So I think we're going to have a hybrid of in-person, uh, a virtual terminal that people can approach in person, um, and as well as uh, potentially holding in-person and distanced meetings. I think it's probably going to be an all three approach for us at the end of the day. One of the things that we're doing in Asheville in terms of council meetings it, right now is um, for people who would have wanted to come to the meeting and offer public comment, we are, um, we are asking that they um, 
call a phone number by five o'clock the day before to offer their public comment in that in a in a voice message essentially three minutes um, just like they have uh, they would have if they were standing in front of us and then a staff member um, plays we plays those recordings back for us at city council um, and and that is okay um, what it doesn't allow for is the you know if someone's sitting watching us and they are motivated to make a comment you know ordinarily they would just get up and go to the microphone and say something and, and mm -hmm. they can't right we don't have a way for them to interact with us real time um, and I don't if anybody has figured that out um, I would love to I would love to hear it but we don't we don't have that right now a couple of things we've been doing at the city is uh, the Historic Preservation Commission which is based out of our department as well uh, they used a phone-based meeting, so they provided a phone number for people to call in and participate. And then we've also been using Facebook Live pretty successfully, too, for uh, engagement. Um, as a follow-up question, do you feel all that, this, that the advances that you're making in remote participation, because again, as Jacob said, it's going to be a multi-pronged approach. Do you feel that the advances that you're making now will be here to Day and thereby, you know, in a post-COVID world, um, increase your overall engagement? Well, Lynn, I, I appreciate your, your optimism that you think there will be a post-COVID world someday, and I'm, I'm <laughs> curious to know uh, when, when, when folks think that might arrive. But um, one, one of the things that this, one of the many um, uh, things that the coronavirus surfaced, certainly in our city, was, was just the divide between those who have High quality broadband internet, internet access and those who don't. And, and Chattanooga is really fortunate to have a really great publicly owned broadband network that um, is available to every household in the city, but, but there's still several thousand um, as of the time the virus hit that, that did not have that. So approaching it from, from kind of a meta level, one of, our, one of our challenges and things we tried to really dig into is to try to see how much it would really cost to get every household hooked up to at least a basic um, uh, gig internet package because I think it was second or third week of March that our the, the uh, Tennessee public schools were, were sent home uh, and you just had tons of kids who, who needed that to do any sort of basic instruction and so we try to do a lot of things Wi-Fi hotspots at public parks and and just really paying to get some households hooked up uh, to our gig internet infrastructure and certainly uh, this this augurs sort of a bigger conversation around why we need to have, I think, a more comprehensive national broadband plan for, for a lot of communities, particularly the rural communities outside of big, dense urban metros like Chattanooga. Um, and I hope that those, uh, from an advocacy standpoint, I would love to see that continue uh, in addition to whatever actual work we've been able to do on the connection side. That's, that's really helpful. Um, any, anyone else? I have another question. I'll just say, I mean, I think we're going to learn the lessons that we'll incorporate into our work. I think understanding even how to do this, like what actually works, you know, I think everybody learned really quickly that like Zoom calls serve a purpose, but, but there's, we're learning as we go that maybe it's better to combine like a YouTube video with a survey follow up with a small group, you know, anyways, I think we'll be able to take lessons like that in, in the sequencing of engagement well into the future in post COVID-19. And I would just say the more tools, the better. Yeah. Um, we've gotten a number of questions around open space um, and having, and, and cities across the country as well in Europe are transforming or closing down streets, closing down golf courses or trying to create more open space. What have you all done to create uh, or to uh, enable a greater public realm for people to to be outside uh, in a socially distant way. I mean, this has been so painful um, here in Asheville because again, like everybody else, our parks are closed. Um, and in some ways you think, you know, for, for people of privilege, that's not a problem because you can get in your car and you can go drive the Blue Ridge Parkway or you can go to Pisgah National Forest or you can go to the Smokies. Well, the Smokies are closed. Pisgah National Forest is largely closed. The Blue Ridge Parkway is now closed. Um, so all of those other opportunities are, are not open. Um, the, the, the issue that we had on our golf course, um, it was originally when the, the stay at home order came, it was closed and then people started using it as a park. 
and gathering and not social distancing. So we closed it uh, and then the manager of the golf course said, no, no, I think we can, I think we can reopen. I think we can open enforcing some protocols. They tried that, it didn't really work. So it got closed again. Um, it has now reopened. Uh, I, I believe it, it's, I believe we're in the stage that it is open um, with again, some very strict protocols on social distancing, but you know, not, not having these outdoor spaces natural spaces for people to be uh, has been really hard. And, and I, I try to drive through downtown as much as I can a few times, you know, a couple times a week that I go out. And, you know, there's, there's also nobody downtown. Um, it, so I think people are filling the streets in some of our other neighborhoods, North Asheville, West Asheville, but, you know, downtown is, um, people are not, people are not hanging out there, which is sad. Yeah. I would, I would say too, uh, uh, Chattanooga is a very similar uh, position. We're, we're a city that has a great outdoor culture. It's, it's one of the real uh, points of pride for us, uh, but it was our posture for, for many weeks, right? Really up until present, uh, that the mayor you know, would say our responsibility is to give people as few reasons to leave their house as possible. And that included closing off our parks, our city owned parks and public spaces and our county followed not long thereafter. We're now, we're now pivoting to try to sort of say, you know, we believe that, that the data for, for Hamilton County, Tennessee is such that we can safely start to re reopen things a little bit, which I'm uh, very excited for myself and, and certainly we've heard a lot of, of, of frustration from constituents uh, who, who miss their access to their parks. But the, the challenge there from, from our office standpoint is to just sort of reinforce even more than we have that uh, this is not a mission accomplished moment for, for Chattanooga or for the country and that, that coronavirus is still very much a threat, will be with us for quite a long time. Uh, all the sorts of things that we were needing people to do five or six weeks ago, we need them to do even more face masks, hand washing, social distancing, all that sort of stuff. And that's, uh, I, I have a high degree of, of faith in our, in our community to, to follow those things, but it's something that, that we can't uh, take our foot off the accelerator in terms of messaging just yet. And Carrie, don't you find that this is, and for, for both of you all, it's less about opening up the parks that you have and more about creating more public realm. If nobody is downtown, well then, boom, you know, direct people down there, close it off to cars. You know, I would love to see New York City um, yeah. close off like every other street. It feels to me that some lemonade that we can make out of this is creating more public realm. Mm -hmm. um, and that, may, that and if we're, and if there is no post COVID world, this, this is a great opportunity. So yeah. are, are you all thinking about that at the highest levels of leadership or, you know, trying to, um, trying again to, to create more opportunity. Yeah, it's a great question. We've, we've not gone as far as some communities in terms of the COVID streets and some of the things that I know a lot of, a lot of uh, other cities have done, have done so well. I think for us, again, it's a little bit about making sure we're not sending a dissonant message by closing a city asset and then trying to uh, encourage even tacitly uh, a situation where there might inadvertently be some public gathering that we're very much from a public health standpoint trying to prevent from happening. So, uh, Cities that are that are that are able to do that and have those strategies in place, I think, are awesome. Uh, with us, it's been we're a little spoiled in the sense that we've got some really great parks and some some wonderful, you know, public space assets within a very simple, you know, couple minutes drive. Uh, chasing people out of them <laughs> has been our our charge up into present, and we're hoping we, we can pivot out of that pretty soon. I would say one of the things. Oh, go ahead. Jake. No, go ahead, Dan. I would say one of the things we recently just did is last um, last summer and fall, we piloted a project where we closed down part of our alleyway network uh, in downtown and we incorporated public space into that. So we put out, you know, tables and chairs and, and benches and uh, we saw huge success in that. We know this year we're going to have to adjust things, maybe spreading the tables a little bit further apart, but people are still going to use that. And we, we have a growing population downtown. More and more people are moving to our downtown core. So they're going to be using this space and um, we're also using this time right now to plan. We have a, a street that kind of runs right alongside. It's a, it's an alley that's technically a street and we're going to spend some time learn, um, studying how to uh, convert a portion of that into a bike and pedway. Yeah. One I mean, of the things we're, that, launching, uh, we're launching, like I mentioned, a shared streets program. We have open streets that closes over three and a half miles, our shared streets. We'll start with three or four miles and likely expand. Uh, we've been pushing for wider sidewalks because of this. New bike infrastructure will happen. Um, I mean, we, 
I think this is going to have drastic changes in how, at least in the city of Charlotte, we uh, build infrastructure and what it looks like um, because of the access issue. I mean, streets are our greatest assets, 25%, 25 to 30% of uh, the land in our city. So you have to look at how it's allocated. You know, this is an issue that I think also really depends on the culture of the city. Um, what our mayor has said is now is a great time to get out and ride your bike, go for a walk, and people are doing those things. But in our city, if we open parks or if we create public spaces um, where people can gather, they will do that in groups. And it's a cultural issue about how, how much do the citizens really listen to guidance. And, and for us, we've not taken steps to open up public space because people will gather if we do that. Um, I know we, we lost Kerry. He got called off um, on another meeting. So I'll end with this with this one last question to all of you, which is um, what are your, your top three community needs that you see as we emerge from the pandemic? How do you want to shape our, our future cities? And so three, maybe it's just maybe it's just a handful. Well, I think for Asheville and um, this is probably true for, um, for Charleston as well, that, that is where the economy is so much based on small businesses and on tourism. Um, you know, we have to figure out how to, how to reopen safely and how to, how to once again invite people into our city um, in a way that they can feel safe uh, and, that people, and that the people who live here who work in those businesses are also safe. And there are smart people working on that. Um, and working with the, the restaurant and retail industry to figure that out. Um, but that's, that's going to be, that's going to be key um, for our success coming out of this. Oh, Lynn, you're muted. I'm sorry. My son's playing outside the door. Uh, uh, Monica, your, your, your top three, what, what do you, what do you hope for, for Charlotte coming out, out of this? How do you want to see Charlotte change? Um, I, I think that, I mean, we've talked a lot about it, but I will say, I think the public space uh, and our need for small public spaces and gathering spaces, uh, I hope that continues to change and we're able to increase that effort. I saw somebody put in the chat, but I, I also agree, you know, more bike and ped infrastructure and we've been working on that and just continuing to build that. I think that's going to, um, you know, increase and access would be the third thing, access uh, really our transportation and transit network and how we continue to connect people to jobs in an equitable way and to kind of their daily needs. So those are the three things I think in planning we already focus on and in urban design we focus on and we're gonna have to continue doing that. Dan? Yeah, I was gonna say, first I have to say huge thanks to my boss. She's been she's uh, helping me with this um, but she said the th three things that we want to focus on is uh, social service needs um, housing evictions in Fort Wayne and then technology and internet access for students Jacob well uh, I, I, yes to all of those things so it's not just three um, but housing is very important for us making sure that people can make their rent payments that's going to be a huge huge issue for us um, safely reopening the economy, as Julie said, is very important in terms of understanding how we can open our restaurant and, and hospitality industries. And the third thing for us, which might be unique to our geography, is making sure that we're prepared for hurricanes as we enter hurricane season, which is predicted to be active. And if we have a hurricane during a pandemic, we want to make sure we can manage that. So um, that's a really important one for us. Oh, well, excellent. I want to thank all of you for, um, I want to thank all of you for participating today. Um, I think it's just so important that we uh, create a, a platform to talk. I want to remind the listeners, don't forget to register for um, CMU 28, a virtual gathering. We'll have um, even more um, speakers. We'll have close to 70 sessions. And then finally, um, please register for next week's webinar, where we'll be hearing from uh, a number of uh, members of the New Town Builders Association. You know, how how is this pandemic and economic downturn impacting um, the development community? So Jacob, Dan, Julie, Monica, and Carrie, who has left, um, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Say stay, say, stay safe, everyone, and I'll see you next week. Take care. Bye-bye. Thanks.